Okay, everyone's welcome to take their seats. The song is almost over and we'll start. <laughs> and now it's out. Okay, hello everyone. Um, good to see you here. I'm very excited uh, to start uh, the course. What we'll be doing in the next few weeks is talk about uh, cell biology by the numbers. And today in the first uh, lesson, I'd like to cover three things. Uh, one is to tell you a bit about what is expected of you uh, in this course. Uh, the second is giving some sort of a rationale of cell biology, what about uh, cell biology by the numbers, what is it good for, and what will you learn from it. Uh, and the third uh, would be to do some case study or case studies uh, to get a bit of a feel. Uh, in general, I would say today's, today's lecture would, might feel to you in some cases a bit like a teaser. We won't really get into many of the hardcore cell biology by the numbers as we'll get in the next uh, uh, lectures. But as they say, sometimes teasing is okay at least in some circumstances, so that's what I'll be doing today, and in the next lectures we'll really get into the hardcore. Sounds good? Okay, so I'd like to start with, uh, so like before saying what is expected of you in, the, in this course, to sort of like ask the question of what is, you know, why in general come to attend the course in 2014 with, you know, all of our capabilities of, you know, reading things from books or better online or watching movies of the lectures or something like that. What do you expect to get out of uh, actually coming into a lecture hall at a given time and listening to a course? And I'm open for suggestions. <laughs> so what is it in, in coming to a course? What, what would you like to get? What? So we'll start, we'll, we'll try to start with a song every, every lecture. If you have suggestions, you're more than welcome uh, to send, uh, and we'll, we'll choose the best suggestions according to my taste. <laughs> so I guess uh, the fact that we're all together here would enable you to do things you can't do if you're just watching it, say, on your computer at home. Like what? Questions. Questions. Okay, so one thing that we'll be able to do uh, with that will be so like, so it was said questions. So in general, I would say it's, I would expect this course to be interactive, both from my side and from your side, which is all about interactive, right? <laughs> and, 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 and the reason is I think there is much more to be learned by interactive. This course is not about uh, transmitting knowledge. It's not about me just you know, transmitting knowledge to you. It's more about uh, sort of like a state of thinking, state of mind, how to approach problems. And you really, I feel that you really can't really get to the heart of it just by listening to it. You really have to engage yourself in it. So that's why it would be quite interactive, as I'm trying to do right now, and it's still going pretty slow. <coughs> okay, what else will you get from, uh, from actually attending the course? Okay, talk to other students. So, in general, there is a lot to learn from interacting with your peers. Uh, so, as you'll see, we'll have quite a few exercises where uh, we'll ask you to team up with somebody, sometimes it's somebody that you know, somebody, sometimes somebody that you don't know, and to work with them on trying to solve some puzzle together. I think it mimics what often happens in real life, both here in, the, uh, in academia, but also in the general world. We want to see how you, you try to work with somebody on a problem. But it's also about, just like we said about hearing the questions, it's interesting to see you know, what kind of other insights other people have coming from different backgrounds. And also it's even sometimes interesting just to see what other people don't understand. That's also important to see what you think you understand and somebody else does not understand, and vice versa. So that's also something that, you know, just by sitting in front of your screen, you can't get the same way. Anything else that could come from actually being here and, and uh, <coughs> taking the course? Yeah, it's, it's scheduled, otherwise, otherwise tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> so, so it, it, it forces you to actually, okay, so, so very good. So also we'll be forcing you to come here uh, every Wednesday 
four to six, uh, two to four. <laughs> Anything else? I think so. Some other things that I hope would come out of that, and that I hope to be also be able to upgrade your research. So what you'll find is that in some of the exercises that, that we'll be doing, I'll be suggesting <coughs> that you choose a subject in several different places that relate to the things that you're studying in the lab, and you can get the opportunity to present it in front of other people, to present it to me, to try and do all sorts of things that may be some kind of calculations that you wouldn't do otherwise, and by that maybe learn more, maybe get some insight. I can tell you that from last year's course, there were all sorts of interesting, uh, as they say in Hebrew, simonim, what is it in English? All sorts of, uh, of, of uh, insights that came to people as a result of, of attending the course also to their own research and to sharing it with, you know, 50 smart researchers. Anything else? Okay, so this is really some of the things that I think you can take out of, of actually attending a course uh, actually in real life. And so that also brings us to sort of like how is the logic of this course and what are the things expected out of you. So in, the, in terms of, the, of, of giving you a grade, it would work in the following way. It would be composed of uh, three parts. Uh, so 50% of your grade would be coming from exercises. And the exercises will be composed of things uh, that you need to solve, all sorts of questions, as you'll see already this week, as well as things you'll need to be reading and comment about, but all sorts of other things you'll see. There'll be like a TED movie that you have to analyze, and there'll be all sorts of different types of exercises. There'll be kind of like a Sudoku that you'll have to do, which relates to cell biology. We'll try to find things that will be interesting that you'll learn from, and you'll have to invest in them. I'm already telling you this is a course where you'll have to work uh, quite hard, and, and that is because I think this is the way to really learn this kind of skill that you'll be getting here. Uh, and the other 50% would come from the final project. The final project has two, uh, two parts. Uh, it will be, uh, you'll be required to choose a subject of interest to you and to do some sort of a quantitative analysis, some sort of a calculation in the, sort of in the, in the spirit of the case studies that you'll be seeing in class quite a few times before that, and to do two, two things. One would be to present it in front of your peers. In, in, in class, it would usually be something like five minutes. Um, it's actually an interesting challenge, I know, to, sit in, to stand in front of the whiteboard, but I think there's a lot to be gained from that. Uh, so that would be one thing, and the other would be to write a short vignette, something like two pages long. You'll also see examples <coughs> of that uh, throughout the course, uh, that you'll be writing about this calculation, what is the question, usually it starts from some question, all sorts of uh, things that it's relevant for, and I think it will be clearer and clearer after you start doing the exercises. So, so this would be presentation. and uh, written, we call it vignette. Vignette is like uh, a short, uh, short and sweet written piece. So this would be 25% and this would be 25%. In general, you'll find this course is based on a the, on the book uh, that I'm writing together with uh, Professor Rob Phillips a fantastic scientist uh, from Caltech. And the book is called, you would never believe, uh, Cell Biology by the Numbers. Uh, so we'll give you all sorts of, uh, some of the readings would be coming from that. And I hope you'll find them interesting. If, you, if you'd like, I tried to bring quite a few books that uh, were an inspiration <coughs> to me in developing this course. Uh, so afterwards, you're all welcome to come and look. There's a wonderful book called uh, Consider a Spherical Cow, uh, which is all about doing analysis in relation to biology and ecology. Uh, this is the book I'm writing. So this is the draft. Uh, this is Physiology by the Numbers, which is quite interesting about uh, human physiology. Uh, street Fighting Mathematics, which is a 
wonderful book, not only the name, but also <laughs> if you just Google it, you can get it for free online. Uh, very good. And this is the previous book by Rob Phillips, uh, Physical Biology of the Cell, which gives a lot of insight about biological systems. There are links to all these books in, on, the left, on the course website that you can see on the right there. Okay, so a few things I forgot to mention. First of all, our teaching fellow in the course uh, is the student that was the best student last year in the course. Uh, <laughs> so you can already consider if you if you be able to do it next year. So this is Maya Shamir. Uh, Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> um, everything that uh, we'll, tr we'll be communicating over outside of class uh, will be available through the website course. So it's Weizmann ACIL slash CBN. Um, in handing in things in, you don't have to bring paper. We're trying to save on paper and on trees. Uh, so you can just sell, uh, send everything to Cell Biology by the numbers. Uh, at gmail.com. If you have any questions, problems, please uh, send them uh, there as well. Okay, and I think we're good to go. Yeah, so you'll see uh, the lectures, uh, all of them are already uh, videotaped and are available online. Uh, which means that that's very nice. If you didn't understand something, you can go and look at the, at the lecture online and try to understand it better, or you can send it to many of your friends that were not lucky to come and attend the course here. You can tell them about this course. Um, as you can tell from the, from the sort of like course that we're trying to do here, uh, we actually still want you to come to class. So basically, uh, attendance is mandatory in the lectures. If you cannot come, Please just email us there and just say you have a very good reason why. Just tell us why, uh, and that will be okay. Um, we'll be expecting you that uh, if you can't come and you have a good reason, you'll still be watching the lecture, and you'll need to uh, write in an email uh, something that you learned from the lecture that you saw, and one way in which you will improve that lecture. You would have suggested how to improve it. Uh, so that's also trying to make you involved in, uh, in what you're watching. Maybe it's easier to just come. <laughs> okay, how many of the people here, are, just to see, uh, are coming, uh, had their undergrad in biology? How many had in chemistry? How many had in physics? What did I forget? <laughs> math. How many had in math? <coughs> Okay, so we have, a, we, have a good, we have a good mix. I think there are some from engineering I know as well. All are welcome. Um, if you feel that you're missing something, in general, in every lecture that I'm giving, I'm uh, expecting at least 80% of the people to understand 80% of what I'm saying. But because this is a course, I'm expecting 95% of the people to understand 95% of what I'm saying. Please don't, don't feel shy, just ask throughout. That's part of the interactive part of learning. And if you haven't ever heard of proteins, DNA, and things like that, come to me, we'll talk about how we could direct you to things that could help you solve that. If you read just a few simple chapters in essential cell biology, you'll be on track to, I think, to understand uh, everything that we'll be covering here. Okay. I don't remember if we said here that part of, the, of coming to, to lectures also, it's supposed to be more fun. So I hope that would work out in, in coming here. Okay, so some things about uh, cell biology by the numbers. So. In thinking what, uh, what can you gain from, uh, from cell biology by numbers, I usually like to think to start by thinking about it with some analogy uh, of thinking about an alien that tries to understand our society. So, you know, when we're trying to understand cells, it's very complicated. It sometimes feels like very strange. Very, lots of things happen differently from what we used to. And in order to be able to understand that better, I'm trying to think, okay, what, how could I help us in thinking how could we help the alien try to better understand our society? And I was trying to think what kind of book would I offer that alien in order to understand our society better? Any suggestions of books that uh, could be useful? 
common uh, like uh, uh, in common language which could be understood like math. So something written in common language? Yeah, like math. Like math? Okay. An encyclopedia. An encyclopedia? Guinness Book of Records. The Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So the book that I would be suggesting is related to those. And this is like the report of the Bureau of Statistics. You know, the Bureau of Statistics tells you about, you know, what are you uh, supposed to die from and how many kids would you have? What are you spending your times on? What are you spending your salary over? What do you like to eat? How many hours do you watch TV? All of those things that give you some insight into how life actually works. Now, I think a similar thing could really help us in understanding cells that we study in the lab. And for that, we need sort of a Bureau of Statistics of the number of, of things that relate to cells. So for that, a few years back, uh, I started a database called BioNumbers. So if you just Google BioNumbers, it would pop up. And there you can find now more than 10,000 entries. The idea is kind of like for Wikipedia. And basically, it's a community effort of useful numbers in biology. But they all have to be uh, with reference to the primary literature, meaning that they have to go through peer review. The numbers themselves had to be published in a place that went through peer review. And from that, we could be sure that actually at least a few people we're following on that, checking that they make sense. And if not, you can write in the comments, and then we can uh, edit or remove them. So this would be a useful resource for getting some of those numbers uh, in all sorts of things. So that could help you, in, for example, when you're trying to think, um, by that improving your intuition on how cells work. So for example, let's say I often like to think about uh, E. coli, the bacteria, which serves as you know, the, it's the molecular biologist's pet of you know, the, the, the thing we really like to uh, work with and, and, and understand somewhat. Uh, so let's say if I'm the size, I, I'm interested in sizes, so if I'm the size of an E. coli, what would be the size of a ribosome? What would your intuition say? What? Like a P. Okay, so it's the sort of thing that if you start, yes? If you start thinking like in, in those things, you might be getting a better, uh, a better intuition. And actually, if you, look, if you can do the calculation, roughly it would be the size of my nail. So not very far from a P. Excellent intuition. <laughs> well done. I don't know what an is. <laughs> <laughs> we just, sometimes it's better to have some distance from the thing. <laughs> Similarly, you could ask, OK, say if I'm an E. coli, and I'm studying and I have a budding yeast next to me. What would be the size of a budding yeast if I'm the size of an E. coli? Yeah, so it's a, about 50 times larger. And it means that it's roughly the size of an elephant. If you think about the human cell, say like a HeLa uh, cell line, that would be about the size of a blue whale. OK? These sort of things, you might, I think, from this course, you might start to get a lot of intuition about cells and different things. Of course, sizes are the easiest part. It becomes more and more complicated. So for example, if you think about the resources that cells have, how many of you ever looked at the, under a microscope and saw cells moving? OK, quite a few. So if you look, for example, at, you know, at cell lines, which are motile, you can see them you know, running over the microscope, moving. So I have a question for you. What percent of the energy of the cell is spent on motility? So that is, if I'm thinking about, say, the ATP required for that cell, for just you know, for its uh, for its life, and I'm thinking, let's say, let's take some sort of a of a human cell line that's moving there on the on the microscope that you were looking at, and I would challenge you to think, is it, say, smaller than 0.1%? Is it 0.1% to 1%? Is it 1 to 10%? Or is it uh, larger than 10%? OK, we have A. So this was supposed to be smaller. A, B, C, or D. Is the question clear? 
OK, who's voting for? We'll start from the end now. I see there's a, some. So who's for D? OK, I have about, um, I'd say, 10 to the 1 people. Uh, who, who's voting for C? Uh, maybe, maybe it's 2 10 to the 1 people. Uh, who's voting for B? 10 to the 1 half. And who's voting for A? Three people. OK. So the answers are in your homework. So I won't say it now. But uh, I think at least some of you would be surprised. Uh, so you'll get all of the information in, in, as part of your homework. There's uh, this very uh, short piece that we just published called uh, the quantified cell. Uh, it's a uh, three page long or something like that, a period in molecular uh, biology of the cell. And from reading that, you'll get some insight into this and a few other things. OK, so in terms of the, of the things that you'll be getting in this course, I would say one thing that I already mentioned is improving your intuition. The other would be um, an ability to test or refute hypotheses. So what you'll find is that uh, my hope is that from this course, you see that you're sitting in, uh, in a lecture in, a, you know, in your departmental uh, seminar, and somebody you know, claims to measure something or says something in the introduction about whatever the number of bacteria in the, in the ocean or the rate at which a signal is moves in signal transduction. And you'll be able to just take a pen and just very quickly to do some sanity check and in quite a few places, you'll find that through doing that analysis, you can actually maybe find that actually they're wrong. Or alternatively, in all sorts of experiments that you do, you might be saving a lot of time by finding from the beginning what can work and cannot work. So I hope you will we'll go through uh, some examples of that. Um, another thing that would happen through uh, that, uh, that kind of reasoning is to suggest uh, new questions. So I think you'll find that this question that we had here about the energy for motility, I think that from uh, thinking, when you'll see the answer, uh, at least uh, most of you would find that there are, it, it raises all sorts of questions that might have not arisen otherwise by actually looking at the numbers behind them. And finally, we'll be getting a general skill of estimations that I think it goes much more generally. It would be useful for you for your research here at Weizmann, anywhere else that you go, but I would hope that it would also be useful for you wherever uh, you take it further from that. So actually, much of this is, is, is so like anchored in what's known as Fermi problems. So Fermi problems is, the, is so like a, the name for these kind of estimations that we'll be often doing. It comes from the name of Enrico Fermi, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, winning physicist that is claimed to have been doing it you know, all day long on all sorts of different uh, uh, questions. The famous question that, you know, that uh, is usually given on that is trying to, uh, you know, you go and you ask somebody, give me your best uh, estimate on how many piano tuners there are in Chicago. He lived in Chicago, so that was his question. And those of you who haven't heard that before, it might sound a bit odd in the beginning, right? Well, you know, how would I ever know how many piano tuners there were in Chicago? I was never there. But then if you take such a problem and you start to divide it do, into different parts, you see that actually you can reason quite a lot about it. So, he's been, and, and so we'll take all sorts of such examples. Uh, and it turns out now that it's a very useful tool also because it turns out that now it's being asked in all sorts of interviews for, uh, for work by different companies. I just heard somebody being interviewed for Google was asked, how many ping pong balls can you put into the back trunk of a, of a truck? How do you calculate that? Or somebody else was asking, how many uh, buckets of, of paint 
do you need in order to paint the uh, white separating lines on the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem? And you have to estimate it now. Will you be able to do it or not? I'm pretty sure that after this course you'll be able to do it. Do you have other examples that you've gone through, uh, that you've heard of the such questions? Of in, uh, what? The number of windows in New York. Number of windows in New York, excellent. That's if you want to be, uh, if you want to get a job as a Zagag, somebody, who, you know, <laughs> in construction maybe. In McKinsey. In McKinsey. <laughs> yeah, in McKinsey they ask these questions quite often. Actually, just two, like, two hours ago I was in a <coughs> seminar here on campus and they were talking about the fact that plants and animals would have to adapt uh, to climate change by moving, say, if you're moving towards the poles. And it was interesting. I, the, the, the other things I was less interested in the talk, so I started talking with uh, a professor that was sitting next to me, and I told him, hey, it's interesting. How fast do they actually have to, have to go in order to adapt to climate change? If they really, if they really started doing it today, Continuously, how fast do you actually have to go? So he said, ah, it's very, very slowly, very, very slowly. So what would be your guess? Is it slow or fast, or what would it be roughly? How would you ever even approach this question, right? So let's just try and do it very briefly. So, okay, so we live on planet Earth, right? Okay, and we don't know exactly what would happen uh, in terms of climate change, but the estimates talk about what kind of change in temperature, roughly? Right, so delta T is estimated to be 2 degrees Celsius, unless we really do something in helping ourselves very quickly, in a change of time of about 100 years. Okay. And over what distance, so this is what's going to maybe happen. And now if you want to adapt to it, what do you have to do? You have to go north, let's say if you're in Israel. And how much, or south if you're in, uh, in Argentina. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a distance here of how much roughly? 10,000 kilometers. About 10,000 kilometers. That's delta L. And what's the difference in temperature? So let's say here it's about 30 degrees Celsius, and here let's say it's, I don't know, minus 10. So delta T of about 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, so wh what are we talking about? It's, it's going to be hotter. If it's going to be hotter, we want to move towards the poles in order to correct for that. Okay, so delta T over delta T, big and small. So that's about 2 degrees in 100 years. So that's about 0 0.02 degree per year. On the other hand, I can see what is the distance per degree. So it's about 10,000, 10 to the 4 kilometer over 40 degrees Celsius. So that's what I can just take, uh, let's say, 100 out of this, I will get 2 times 10 to the 2. And that is what kilometer per degree Celsius. So far, so good. OK, so now if I want to know what speed I have to go towards the poles, you can see it could be a bit confusing. What do you need to divide by what? But if you look at the units, it's really helpful, right? Because I have kilometers per degree and degree per year. If I just multiply these two things together, delta L divided by delta T times delta T big T divided by small delta T, I get 2 times 10 to the 2 kilometer per degree Celsius times 0 0.02 degrees Celsius per year. And I'm getting what? Four kilometer per year. <laughs> now there are 300 days a year, roughly, or 400 days a year. So that brings me to about 10 meters per day. 
OK, so if I want to adapt uh, and I'm a tree, I need to walk somehow <laughs> 10 meters a day towards the poles. OK, OK, why did we do that? I, one reason is just, you know, I was just curious to see, you know, is it really slow? Actually, I think that is much faster than what uh, the professor next to me was thinking in his intuition. But these sort of things really give us a tool in order to improve our intuition. In a way, you can think about it, all these things that we'll be talking about in trying to understand cells, it's like giving you a sixth sense. Not only being able to see the cells or hear them or whatever, it actually gives you a new capability to try and understand cells by the numbers. And this is what you get if you just do this sort of thing, if you just break down a problem. So now I'd like to take a, a more biological, a close, also that relates to biology, but let's take another uh, thing that it's not cell biology yet, but uh, let's put you in, in the following position. Any questions about this, uh, by the way? Not completely accurate because the first, the first few thousand kilometers, you changing the attitude much more with every kilometer than when you get into the pole. Excellent. So as you're pointing out, there's an issue here about how does temperature change with distance. And I agree, there is that fact. But as you'll see, we saw like in most cases, we have to ask of it, about each of such what, they, what is known as caveats, any complication that relates to these things. How much would they affect, you know, how large would be the effect on the problem that we're trying to study? In this case, I was just looking for the order of magnitude. I was trying to ask, okay, what is it roughly? Is it like a, a millimeter a day? Or is it 10 meters a day? Or maybe it would have been much bigger. For that, I would imagine that what you're saying would give me a two-fold change, three-fold change, maybe even less, maybe just 20%. If it's that, I wouldn't care so much. If it's much more than that, that then it requires big attention. OK? Thanks for pointing that out. OK, so now the challenge for you is the following. Uh, How much time will it take you, and I'm thinking of you as, a, as a, like an experienced uh, sprinter, to respond <laughs> in a 100 meter dash to the referee um, gun, uh, shot, pistol. Okay, you're sitting there, finally after years of preparation, and you need to dash in the 100 meter sprint, there is the pistol firing, and the question is how, what would be the delay, how quickly can you start running? And the question is it, would it be less than a, less than a millisecond? less than a millisecond? Would it be 1 to 10 milliseconds? Would it be 10 to 100 milliseconds? Or would it be larger than 100 milliseconds? <coughs> Is the question clear? Any? Where is it standing? That's, you have to decide. Think about you know, the last uh, Olympic Games or anything that you saw. Uh, where they had the, uh, where they ha had a 100 meter dash, and you can do any, any assumption that you'll be there as long as you, as you're happy with it, I'll be happy with it as well. Any other clarifications about the question? Okay, so we'll do the following. Uh, we'll now take a 15 minutes recess, as part of the lecture recess. But during that, uh, you have to pair with somebody. And you have to spend five minutes trying to give an answer to this question. Does that make sense? <coughs> but before that, you have to vote. So who thinks it's uh, less than one millisecond? Who thinks it's one to 10 milliseconds? About 10 people. Who thinks it's 10 to 100? Most people. And who thinks it's more than 100 milliseconds? Another 10 people. OK. Uh, spontaneous uh, response, so uh, it 
I would say I try to see you know as realistic as possible. You know, once there is the gunshot, how quickly would you or, or the runner there, the, an experienced runner, would respond? As as from the fact that they heard the shun, the gunshot and started running. Okay, so take another five minutes together with somebody trying to think about it. You can go for recess and we'll be meeting here at five after three. Five minutes after three. Okay, we are back. Okay, so I, I, I went through quite a few people and I saw you had very good directions to, to analyze it. How, how do we approach this question? So as in general, when you have like a, a sort of like Fermi problems, a very useful tool is called divide and conquer. <laughs> ah, conquer, conquer, conquer. Which means that I'm taking the problem and I'm trying to break it into several parts that would help me think about it. Okay, so what do we have here? Uh, we have the person, I'm not very good at drawing as you see in the course, but you have the person here waiting to run or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, uh, that's even tougher, right, we have a gun, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> And what would be the parts in trying to analyze the time? I can break it down into different things that need to happen, right? What needs to happen? Okay, so one thing that has to definitely happen is to hear that gunshot in his ears or whatever. Okay, what else has to happen? Move the body. So, but in order to do the moving the body, how would you break it some more? Okay, so okay, so so good. So something has to happen here. That's for me. Neuroscience is something here. Then something has to happen from here to here. That's that's the general view, right? And maybe after you have some here, here it has to start doing the running. Okay, so let's start and think about this. So I have here A, B, C, D. That's part of my divide and conquer strategy. Okay, what should we start with? How, why won't we start with A? Okay, so what can you tell me about the, the time difference that would result out of it? So from that gunshot, we have two things governing it, right? The distance and the speed of sound. So what assumptions did you take for the two numbers? What did you take for the distance? Well, it depends on like, uh, how accurate you want uh, the estimate to be. Like, if, you want just to, uh, if you want just to estimate between these four categories, then uh, you should look at the speed of uh, sound. And uh, like, like if, it's, uh, uh, if you want it to be more efficient, for, for it to be more than 100 milliseconds, then the distance should be more than 33 meters according to the speed of sound. And if you believe that the distance to the referee from the ear of the respondents should be between 3 and 33 minutes. Okay, so we can go in that direction. I usually, we try to make some sort of a reasonable assumptions. And we don't know exactly what would be the case at your specific uh, position, but I've heard a delta, a distance of, I've heard, 5 meters. Maybe 10 meters is nicer, right? We like round numbers. And then we need the velocity, which is what? 300. Okay, 340, I like to do it 300 meters per second. Okay? So what would be the delta T? It would just be 10 meters divided by 300 meters per second. Meters falls with meters, have 10 divided by 300, so it's 1 over 30 of a second, which is roughly 30 milliseconds. Those of you coming from, you know, having somewhat better math than I do would might be appalled by saying 1 over 30 being called 30 milliseconds. You'll have to live with it in this course, and that is because it's all about the accuracy that we're looking for. 
right? If you look at the answers that we're trying to fall, this would not move you from this to that, right? It wouldn't give you a factor of 10. 10%, 30%, not an issue here, okay? Okay, so we have 30 milliseconds. So just before we move to part B, do you see some problem with that? You know, it's a, you know, that actually has to work in the Olympic Games. It's larger than the typical variation between two runners. Okay, so what you're saying is it's larger than the typical variation between runners. Okay, I would say both in terms of when you look at them, how fast they're moving, and also in terms of the records, right? If you look at, you know, what are the differences, it could be on the order of that. So that could be not so fair, right? It what might be that the judge is firing and you're next to him, or if you're at the other end, you might be losing a few precious milliseconds. So you know what they did? They changed speakers. what? They have speakers for every round. Exactly. So they now moved and they put speakers behind them mm -hmm. such that each one actually it now is noiseless. They made it such that it has no noise and also because of the speed of, of, uh, of light, they also don't make it such that you see like a smoke coming out. He says, uh, get on your marks, get set, and then they hear it from the speakers, and then the speakers are sitting just next to each one of them inside in the same distance. Okay, they're serious, these guys. <laughs> so it's much less than five meters. So, 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 so effectively, it's like probably, I don't know exactly, one it's like meter. half a meter or something like that. So it's more like half a meter or a meter. Okay, so it's so it's it's definitely less than less than uh, thirty milliseconds. Yeah, so so if we move it to one meter, that would be I don't know on the order of like three milliseconds. Okay, let's move on. What should we move on to? It might make sense to move to B, but actually I, I can't tell you much about B. Let's move to C. Okay, and we'll see what to do with B. Okay, so what happens in C? What are the relevant things there? Okay, so first of all, you know, the, the, the equation, it's lovely, you'll see it, you know, almost all of the equations that we'll be doing in this course, you already learned in, I don't know, junior high school. Uh, maybe, maybe high school. And actually, I find that that's really usual, usually the case. Like people coming, say, from physics, they're not any better in doing those things because they know, you know, very complicated math. It's just because they might have been, had more experience of trying to do these sort of estimates and using and feel more uh, comfortable playing around with numbers. But actually, anyone coming from a good high school anywhere should be able to do these analysis and estimate just as well if they feel happy about it and, and they're willing to, to take the chance. Okay, so we, again, in order to know delta t, we need to know, so I was just heard, so delta L is about, let's make it two meters. These people are usually tall and strong, right? And what is the, the relevant velocity? So what are we talking? Velocity of what? Okay, so this is about the action potential speed, right? Okay, finally we're moving into some cell biology, right? So for this you need to know the action potential speed. Now. Here you'll find this is something that separates a bit the normal way of people doing estimates and what needs to be done in molecular biology or in this course. Usually if we're doing analysis like, you know, how many windows there are in New York, you're already bringing all of the intuition that you need uh, already with you in the sense that, you know, probably been in New York or if not, you've been to Tel Aviv or whatever. And you know how many windows there are in a normal house or something like that. And most of the things you already know for the numbers that you need. In molecular biology, it could sometimes be tough because none of us, I imagine, has seen an action potential actually move, right? Although if you go back and see uh, uh, back in the, uh, in the drawings of how Kirchhoff uh, was measuring, the, he was, uh, I think, the first to measure the speed of the action potential, you can see the experiments that he did with all sorts of taking uh, uh, legs of frogs and you know, putting some electricity signal here and seeing how it moves. They had ingenious ways of doing it in order to find that speed. And actually today we find it quite accurate, uh, still today reasonably accurate. So we don't have a wonderful intuition for those things. That's why you need to know some numbers sometimes. There are two ways to do it. You either just 
you know, heard them, maybe in a course that you took, maybe in this course, or you can just Google it, and for that, it's, it's nice that we have something like bio numbers. That was one of the original reasons why we started, because if you want to do these calculations, if you just try to Google just like that, very often you don't get the numbers. But if you actually have, it leads you to some database where you can find those things, it can save you a lot of time. And you'll find you don't need to know lots and lots of numbers, because as you'll see in the course, by knowing just very few numbers, some key numbers, you can make lots and lots of estimates. It all goes back to some key uh, properties. Okay, so if you just uh, try to find what, what did you, anyone got some estimate and what is the action potential speed? 100 meters per second. Again? Between uh, 50 to 120 meters per second. Okay, right, so, so it depends on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the diameter of the nerve. And a general number usually given is the order of magnitude is between 10 and 100 meters per second. Which is, by the way, it's interesting afterwards to think in an analogy, okay, what is, that, what is that in comparison to other speeds that you know from normal life? But we leave that for now. But from that, we can get an estimate on the time difference, time delay that that would bring, which would be what? I have two meters divided by, I need some number in between here. I'll take 20, 20 meters per second. So that would bring me about 0 0.1 second or 100 milliseconds. If I was looking at the whole range, I would get something between what? If I took 10 meters per second, then, uh, then I would get for 2 meters, that would give me what? 50. So I can just start and looking at each of the cases. If I have 2 meters divided by 100 by 10 meters per second, I'm getting 2 point, 0 0.2 seconds. On the other hand, if I was taking 2 meters, dividing it by 100 meters per second, I'd be getting 20 milliseconds. So somewhere between 200 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds. OK, does that make sense? OK, we could now start and look also at what happens in the, in the speed in our muscles. Actually would say that for now, that's about what I wanted to go through. It's interesting, by the way, in the Olympic Games, the way it works today, is that from the time the judge uh, shoots his pa uh, pistol, they have gauges of, uh, of sensors of seeing exactly at what time each uh, runner started to run. If it was less than 100 milliseconds, if it was 100 milliseconds or less, automatically disqualified. Because they know that you can't do it in faster than that. You can't do it in less than 100 milliseconds. Actually, the fastest runners, there's all sorts of statistics. It turns out that in the Beijing uh, Olympics, they had <coughs> one in a thousand cases where it was between 110 and 120 milliseconds. The others are faster, are, are slower than that. And now you can get something about the intuition. Where does that come from? Because we're getting about 100 milliseconds just from the response, some of it from the, most of it from the action potential running here. From the distance, it's negligible. Something also happens in the brain. Something maybe is happening with the muscles. So this is also, I think, uh, shows one of the things I wanted to show, and that is the fact that in, in, except for giving you some order of magnitude, about things, it also raises all sorts of questions. It's not that by doing this calculation we solve the whole problem. It raises all sorts of interesting questions, like how much distance has to run in your brain of action potentials, and how much delay would that bring? Or how much delay should happen from the time that the, what is it, neuromuscular junction gave the order for the muscle to contract, how long would the contraction take? If anyone wants to do a, a final project on that, I think that could be a, an example of an interesting question. How fast does it, does it take to a muscle to contract, and where does that come from? There's a uh, very famous example of uh, Usain Bolt in the 2011 World Championship in athletics, where he started, he did a false start under 100 milliseconds, and he was disqualified, although he was the favorite, the favorite runner. 
So Any what, questions about that? What, what really takes 100 milliseconds? What? What really takes 100 milliseconds then? So I as far as I understand, the largest fraction is from the, is related to the exit potential speed. So some of it comes, you know, in the brain and some of it in this process. We only got to 20 though. What? We only got to 20. Okay, so what, when I got to, so we got to a range between 20 and 200. This is. This was assuming that it's in the you know in the fastest re, in the fastest res, uh, reported action potential. This is in the slower one. We were just doing here getting the range of numbers. So under some characteristic value, I was getting about 100 millisecond, and I don't really know whether it would be in that end of the numbers or here. But I would be quite sure that it's not A. That it's not B. Probably not C from the analysis that I did here, although I can't fully guarantee that. And, and, and it, it's very likely to be D. You can, you can also test it with other link again. If you try pressing a stopwatch twice, one after each other, without, you know, the fastest you could, you can never get less than 100 milliseconds. Okay, so he, here is an example of, of the thing. So it gives us some new perspective on what it means to respond like in a split second. Right? What is this split second? We can now try and think about what does it mean. In all those games of trying to respond as quickly as you want, it turns out that, uh, for example, in, uh, in music, you do find that you're able to do uh, uh, rhythms in rates. Those most experienced musicians can do all sorts of things that are faster than 100 milliseconds. So how could that be? So you can do, what we talked here about is your ability to respond to something that you didn't know was happening. Unless you're responding even without hearing the, the shot, which actually does happen. But that's why they made them disqualified, because that's why people were responding faster. Because they had a hunch, how long would it take from saying on your on set, you know, go. In, in the sense of, of being able to respond, in some cases you actually be able to respond faster, but that's because you're very trained and actually, you gave the order, you know, you already trained your something to respond without all the neural circuitry uh, in our body doing that. Okay, how are we doing with time? Okay, I think we're doing fine. <coughs> okay, so let's try and, and take uh, another example of, of trying to approach a question in such a way. And now I'd like to move into the into cell biology. And the question would be uh, relating to something that's, you know, what are the key players inside cells? They are proteins, right? So very often, in order to try and gain some uh, understanding of what happens inside cells, we'd like to know, this is not very good. How many proteins are in a cell? Let's make it specific, let's say in a bacterial cell. And then to make it concrete, those who know the answer, please don't shout. Some of you might have uh, already been through that. Let's say, is it A between 10 to the 3? 10 to the 5, B is it 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7, C would be 10 to the 7, 10 to the 9, or D would be 10 to the 9, to 10 to the 11. Is the question clear? How many types or how many molecules? Okay, very good. How many types or how many molecules? What am I asking here? Molecules. Okay, I'm talking about how many molecules. So I'm actually counting one, two, three. I don't care how many copies of each, I'm taking all of them together. Uh, like, uh, what, like all, all, all sorts of uh, proteins, which are like uh, 10, 10, 10 nucleic acids long, uh, not nucleic acids, but uh, amino acids. Amino acids long, like, do we count them as proteins? Or? So I'm counting as proteins what people count as proteins, usually. Okay, usually. I don't think there are, then it's peptides if it's like five or ten amino acids, but anything that is considered 
amino, uh, considered a protein, doesn't matter if its role is one thing or another, would be relevant for this calculation. Okay, who's voting for A? One. Okay, who's voting for B? Another two. Okay, so I have one person voting for this. Two people voting for this. How many people voting for C? About 10. And how many people voting for D? Okay, there were a majority, I don't know, 30. Okay. So now I'd like to uh, try and do it together. And again, we'll try and do it by finding some way of doing a divide and conquer to the problem. So the way I suggest to approach is to start from the cell size. From that, I could get the cell mass. From that, I'd like to move from the normal cell mass to mass in units that are more helpful for me, which is mass in Dalton. On that, I'll need to also use the protein mass. Mass per uh, protein mass, and from that and that, I'll get the number of proteins. Okay, so it could be it could give us a bit of a different answer if we try to do it with volume. <coughs> Let's see what happens here, and then we'll see the question on such uh, relating to this is whether that would mo would have the potential to give us an error by doing this versus a different way of moving us from answer C to D or C to B or whatever would be the relevant answer. And I would claim that. In most cases, if you do it, say, by mass or by volume, each one would be a, dif a bit differently. It would usually not be anything that would move us more than a factor of, less than a factor of two. OK, so just going through that again, we'll talk about what is the cell size from that cell mass, from that how many mass, what is the mass in some other units. We'll try to put in something about what is the mass per protein, and by dividing these two, we know the number of proteins. But the fraction of cell that is composed of proteins Right, we'll have to do that. We'll have to fit that in somehow as well. Okay, so let's go ahead. Why don't we, can I do it here? Okay, so step one, cell size. How does an E. coli look like? I like to see it like this. Okay, and what would be its size? About one micron, so you could say this is about one micrometer. Just to remind us all, that's 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay, what does that tell us about the volume? 10 to the minus 18. So I would roughly say it's one micron by one micron by one micron. So about one micrometer cube or 10 to the minus 6 meter cubed, so that's 10 to the minus 18 meter cubed. Okay, now I want to go to mass. So mass is the volume times the density, right? So I have 10 to the minus 18 meter cubed times density. What is the density? One. one. Okay, so in general, the answer to everything is one, almost in, in the course. <laughs> let, let me write it as 10, but now it's all about what is the exponent. Okay, so we're not everything, the answer is 10, but then 10 to the what? So in this case, we're interested, let me put it in the relevant units. So when you were saying one, you were thinking about what? Okay, so one is like water, right? Water has density of one, and it's good, it's good enough to say that also a cell has a density of one. But this is one, meaning what? One liter is one kilogram, right? So for the density you're thinking, one liter would give me one kilogram, and that's one. 
OK, that's fine. But now we're working in meters cubed. So how many liters there are in a meter cubed? A thousand. A thousand, good. So I have about 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed. OK? So that gives me 10 to the, fi to the minus 15 kilograms. OK, for the cell. OK. Is there a more concise way of saying it? For that, there are all these uh, funny names, right? So there is kilogram is 1,000 grams, right? So quickly, let's go through them. There is milli, which is 10 to the th minus 3. Micro, 10 to the minus 6. Nano, 10 to the minus 9. Femto, eh, excuse me, pico. 10 to the minus 12, femto, 10 to the minus 15. And if you're going further than that, probably you had some mistake in the, in the number conversion, or you actually got into a very interesting, extremely low regime. OK, so this is 10 to the minus 15 is uh, femto kilogram. But femto kilogram is a bit funny, right? Because the kilo is all about multiplying by 1,000. Femto is 10 to the minus 12. So actually, it's about 1 picogram, or a thousand femtograms. OK, so far so good. Let's try and move from here onward. So what do I, OK, so I got from cell size to cell mass. That's done. Now we'll find, and this is, might be surprising, but actually throughout we'll find that very often it's very useful in, thing, in moving from the, so the, all these units are the units that we're regular, used to from the normal world of the macro world, if you like, of kilograms or grams or whatever. In trying to think about cells, we usually want to do the transition from that into units of Dalton. Or, and for that, or in general, we have to go through the Avogadro constant jump. What, what do I refer to? So what is a Dalton? A Dalton is a unit of mass where, OK, what do I divide? What do I remove now? What is the best real estate to take now? I guess we can remove this again. OK, so Avogadro number, which as you'll see will prop up quite a lot of times, is equal to roughly 6 times 10 to the 23. It's just a number, unitless. And this is a very useful number that connects us from the world that we used to to the world of cells. How does it connect us in this case? We know that this number of units of Dalton weighs what? How much? One gram. OK, a Dalton is defined. You might remember if you have a mole of hydrogen atoms, it would weigh one gram. Sounds familiar? Or if you, if you have a mole of something that has a molecular weight of 12, like uh, carbon, would be 12 grams. OK, what is this mole? Mole is exactly the Avogadro number of things. OK, so if I have a, a mole or an Avogadro number of something that's one delta, I get one gram. OK, that's, uh, that's why I could just now do the jump quite quickly. I could say if I have. OK, what I removed here was 10 to the minus 15 kilograms or 10 to the minus 12 grams. OK, so now I want to talk about uh, my mass of cell, which was 10 to the minus 12, which is 10 to the minus 12 grams. I can now do a trick that I'll be using a lot of time, and that is multiply by 1. Everybody is allowed to multiply by 1 as many times as they want, right? So how do I multiply by 1? I'm saying, OK. I can multiply by 6 times 10 to the 23 Dalton divided by 1 gram. You see I'm, I'm multiplying by 1 because they are just equal to each other. And by that, I'm actually doing the unit conversion. So this is about 10 to the 24 times 10 to the minus 12. I'm getting here 10 to the 12 Dalton. That's the mass of my cell. 
right? Well, if you want, it would have been 6 times 10 to the 11. OK, I actually had here 6 times 10 to the 11. Dalton and I was allowing myself the freedom to do like this. OK, from here, what do we want to know from mass of the cells? So we, we got from here to here. But now, as was pointed out, I'm actually interested not in the mass of the cell, but mass of the proteins, right? OK, so what would be the mass of proteins out of the cell? Mass of proteins divided by mass of cells. So first of all, this does not have units, right? So it's not going to be, this is just a fraction. OK, let's try and do, you know, it's very, it's very common now to do like uh, crowdsourcing of all sorts of things. So let's do a crowdsourcing to the audience here. What number would you say is the fraction of proteins out of the total mass of the cell? 0.4. OK, so what is, what, what is the vast majority of what you have in, inside the cell? Water. OK, how much? 70%. That's pretty good. Two thirds about is water. Doesn't matter if you're a bacterium or if you're a human, that's a good estimate. OK, so that already tells us this could not be larger than 0 0.3, right? Because 0 0.7 is, is already water. OK, and now proteins are quite a significant fraction, quite a, a serious player inside cells. If you're actually looking inside E. coli, out of the cell dry weight, I forgot about the 70%, about half of it is proteins and half of it is all the rest. OK, which brings me to about one half of 30% is about 15%, just like was said here, about 10%. OK, so this is about 0 0.1. Actually, it was a bit larger, 15%. So that means that I need to multiply, if I multiply this by 0 0.15, it's just like multiplying this by 0 0.1. So in the same order of magnitude, if I'm going to mass of proteins, I'm getting about 10 to the 11 Dalton. You see how I got from this by 0 0.1 or 0 0.15, doesn't matter. OK, what is the next step? OK, so now I need to know. So you see, I did bring here something, again, that you might have not been born with. But you'll see it's just this very, if you have a notion about okay, what is inside a cell, you can get at it. And if not, by the end of the course, you'll get many, many such things that would be useful for you without you needing to really memorize anything. Because always, you can just write it in, uh, in your smartphone uh, when you search for it in Google. OK, so we need to know something about the protein mass. I'll be doing crowdsourcing again. Uh, what is the mass of a single <coughs> protein on average? 100 kilograms? How? 3,000. So it's about 30 kilodaltons. Is like an average uh, mass, meaning 30,000 deltons. OK, and that's actually not very far. I, had, I heard uh, 10,000, I heard 100,000. So it's somewhere in the middle. OK, so now I can plug this in to finish uh, this, this divide and conquer. So the number of proteins is the mass of the proteins divided by the mass of a single protein, which is 10 to the 11 Dalton, divided by 3 times 10 to the 4 Daltons, which brings me to 3 times 10 to the 6 proteins per cell. So, OK, just a second. First of all, let's. I think we should cheer for the two people who voted for B. I don't remember who they were, but well done. And there was a comment here. But it's too close to the limit between B and C. It's easily reached C. OK, so I would say in the way that we did the calculation right now, which was definitely very crude, one could claim that, hey, maybe I could make myself move into C. I would challenge you to actually put better numbers and you'll see that it's actually next to impossible to put 10 million proteins inside a cell, which is one micron cubed. You just can't fit it. You'll have, you'll have no water there. It becomes, I don't know, a solid. And if you try to put 
10 to the 8 is just physical impossibility. But, but I, I agree with you that this is hard to be sure about. Uh, you can maybe uh, mistake it for that direction. What is the real answer? The real answer? The real answer is that it's between 2 to 4, 10 to the 6 proteins per micrometer cube for bacterial cells, for yeast cells, for human cells. Uh, so it's, it's quite a, this is a good range in general. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, that's going back to the beginning of what are these used for. So in the past few years, there's been quite a lot of uh, mass spectrometry methods being published about evaluating what is the census of what is inside the cell. Each such paper usually appears you know, in either science or nature, nature biotechnology. But then, just like two years ago, I went through these, and I love these numbers and trying to look at those things. And I was summing, and they, they, usually they report you know, how many copies are each protein. But when you sum over the whole list, the value that you got was in several, almost in uh, half of the papers that were dealing with yeast cells and mammalian cells was an order of magnitude too low. I wrote to these people. It seems in the end there is a problem with calibration, all sorts of things like that. We actually published a paper about this. That they actually, people that want to use those data sets have to uh, recalibrate or put a factor there for those numbers. And it's interesting to see that even though you know, those people are super smart, they did also, they're very, you know, the, the best in their field in doing all those measurements, but sometimes you don't think about it from another angle and, and you could actually be wrong in the absolute numbers. Any more comments or questions about that? Okay, so as we're, uh, we have, we're nearing the end, uh, and there's a few things we want to do before that. For the first thing, uh, I need a volunteer from the crowd. And that is because I need to write something. I, I don't think I'll be able to write it so well. Where the effort of what we'll be trying to do now is to try and talk about sizes for a second. And what we'll try to do is to try and make an axis where on one hand we'll have what is the, you know, the biggest thing relevant to this course. Probably, like, let's take the blue whale of cells that we talked about before, a mammalian cell. So what is roughly the size of it? So I'd like to put here something which is like a human cell. This would be size. What would we have on the other end? Or protein. I had virus, protein, atom. Good, let's start with an atom. <laughs> Okay, atom could be, yeah, let's start with an atom. Okay, who could help me uh, do some writing here with the class? Okay, good. And what uh, the, 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 the course effort now is a group effort is to try and fill this with as many things as possible relating to biology. To put them in the right place. And, and it will, yeah. The floor is open for suggestions. Yeah, please. Residues in the atom type. What? Residues. A re like an amino acid. Yeah. Okay. So where should the amino acid be? It's probably good if we have an axis to put some numbers on it, right? Okay. So what would be the number next to an atom? One. Yeah, one I know is the answer to everything. <laughs> but in this case, one what? One angstrom, that's good. But let's, oh, so you can write one, but, but I, I'd like to convert them all to the same unit, so ten let's work. Ten 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 okay, so 10 to the minus 10 meters, right? That's one angstrom, meaning 0 0.1 nanometer. Okay, let's also write a 0 0.1 nanometer. It will help us in a second. Okay, and on the other hand, what would, you, what would be the size that you put there? Half a millimeter? So about 10, 10 what? 10 micrometer. 10 micrometer. Okay. 
and I like to write it this way, small n, small m, and we have a micrometer. A 10 micrometer, good. Okay, and we wanted the, okay, we wanted the residue, so what, where would the residue sit? What would be the size? An amino acid. Several nanometers. Ten. Ten, again. I heard that 100 Dalton. That's in the mass. So what would be the size, roughly? Nanometer? About a nanometer. Yeah, so it's in about a nanometer. Okay, so now there's a tricky part. Where should the nanometer be, exactly? Should the nanometer be here? But this is only 0 0.1 nanometer. Should it be here? But that's already, we're getting to 10 micrometer. Okay, so it would be good to use a logarithmic scale. Good, so I, I, I will be doing it as a logarithmic scale. Logarithmic. Okay, which means what? Between here and there, how many, how many orders of magnitude do we have? Four, six. So that was 10 to the minus 10 meter. This was 10, to the 10 times 10 to the minus 6. So that's 10 to the minus 5 meter. Okay, so we're separating this into five parts. Okay, can you help me separate into five parts, <laughs> roughly? <laughs> okay, so from that, we'll, ah, very good. So now, what, what would our uh, residue be? Okay, we said it's about one nanometer, so it would be here. Okay, what else should we put there? What? A protein. A protein. Okay, a protein or a nuclear. Okay, so we have an amino acid that's in the one nanometer. Good. Protein, where would protein be? 10 to 20 nanometers, I hear. Okay, about 10 nanometers. That's good. Bacteria? Okay, bacteria. Where should the bacteria be? Something is strange. Yeah, okay. Where should, the where should the bacteria be? One micron. What about a virus? Okay, so we could put a bacteria at one micron. Yeah. We had virus. Where does the virus sit? Which virus do you like the most? <laughs> I hear HIV. Okay. Who's voting for HIV? What would be the size roughly? Anyone knows roughly what would be the size? Okay, so that would be about 100 nanometers. Okay, so we have the bacteria here, and we have here a virus, says, say an HIV. Okay, so first of all, you chose very well. We're covering the, the five orders of magnitude. Anything else that you think should fit into here? Yeast. Where would the yeast be? Okay, between a bacteria and the human cell, we'll have the yeast. What else? A DNA. DNA. Okay, D what in the DNA? It's, it's very tough, you know, you could take the DNA in my body and try to stretch it, it would be pretty long. How much roughly? You can calculate it, not complicated. How would you calculate? You need to know something about a single base pair. Okay, a single base pair is roughly what? So it's somewhere in the middle between this and that. So that would be DNA, just to uh, just, uh, say the width of the base pair, that's fine. Okay, something else? Anything you can suggest to fill up some more of the spaces? But you can talk about the, the chromatin that's condensed. Right, I can talk about the nucleosome, for example, and the chromatin structure. Okay. Organelles? Organelles, I had, I had organelles, I had ribosomes. Okay, so where would the ribosome sit? In a protein. A, okay, so a ribosome would sit somewhere between the protein and the virus, roughly in the middle. Okay, I think we have, we have a reasonable coverage. Uh, I hope that uh, by the end of this course you can have such things for any property of interest. So first of all, thank you very much. Thank you.
in the in the exercise that you will be doing uh, for next week, um, and you'll be sending us to that uh, uh, email address, uh, one of the things you'll be doing is reading about a very short one-page introduction about sizes, and you'll be seeing, for example, such a scale for many different things, and we'll ask you to try and add something new that you think could fit more into such a scale. The second thing that you'll see is this short piece that I mentioned in the beginning, the quantified cell, that will give you some, uh, some more of the examples that we're talking of. And the third thing that uh, you'll be doing is a small calculation about yourself, trying to understand better the cells in your body, how many such cells are in your body. And to finish up, I'd like to uh, put one final question. I'm missing this, right? So the last question for today is, what is heavier, or if you like, bigger, an mRNA or the protein it codes for? And yeah, let, let's talk about this is already spliced. Nobody shouts. Um, I will make. A, I'll give you. No, no. I'm just talking about. I have an mRNA, not coated, already spliced, ready to be eaten. And I'm interested in its size versus the protein that would that it would code for. And the question is, is it the mRNA that is bigger? Is it the protein? Is it roughly the same? Or um, it depends. It depends on the protein. Or it depends on gene. Who's voting for A? Who's voting for B? Who's voting for C? Who's voting for D? Okay, so I think this is a good point uh, to send you to do this week's exercise. And did I forget anything? I'm waiting to see you all uh, next week. And we'll be talking about these and related questions. Thank you. So the exercises are for each person separately, yes. And they're all available already in the... Uh,